heart uh, today. Um, I want to thank you for coming. It's a, a topic that I think um, I'm hearing more and more of my clients want to talk about. And so I'm happy to have you here, and I think we'll have some other folks come in, and I appreciate some of the friendly faces I see here. I, my name is Steve Gutierrez. I'm a labor and employment partner here in the Denver office of Holland & Hart. Uh, so primarily uh, advise clients uh, to manage risk associated with employees. Uh, a little lesser degree on the um, actual attraction and uh, retention of folks, although uh, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of giving uh, employment advice uh, helps do that. Uh, I wanted to have uh, my colleague here introduce himself, and I'll do that here shortly, but uh, want to encourage everyone uh, in this particular topic to, in, to make sure that you uh, talk early and often because I think uh, shared experiences often are the best experiences to talk about and real life examples of things we might do to address the issues of the changing uh, landscape of uh, managing employee talent. So with that, I want to introduce a good friend of mine and colleague uh, who I've worked together for a number of years, Chet Marino, and have him introduce himself. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, my name is Chet Marino. I lead a firm known as Veris Partners. So we provide executive search coaching and talent advisory services to mid-market companies throughout the United States. We probably primarily work in technology, industrials, and business services. So I enable companies to realize their business goals through the proper selection and development of people. Thank you, Chet. Uh, as you all know, there's a little bit of food here in the back, and feel free to get up and uh, help yourself to coffee and juice. Uh, today we're going to talk about um, <coughs> Four, four basic topic areas, and that is uh, the investment in human capital. We'll talk then about sort of some proven management techniques and some of the legal issues that affect management. Uh, move on to attracting, developing, and retaining top talent, and then uh, tailoring benefits, uh, which seems to be a real important thing, with rewards and recognition <coughs> in terms of managing talent. So I'll, we'll go ahead and start with Chet. Thanks, Steve. Well, starting with investment in human capital, we know intuitively that hiring good people is a foundation for any business to succeed. On top of that, we know that putting the right people in key positions is really the recipe for success. So therefore, it follows that any investment in human capital becomes a critical component for success in every business. So my belief is that there's no better investment or potential for return than in the proper selection and development of people. Consider for a moment that the sum total of everyone in your company is really the operating system of your company. If you combine all of the people, their talent, their knowledge of your business, their expertise, their skill, and you roll it all in, those are the people that determine the likelihood of your success. So think about what value does your company have at the end of any given day. Assume for a moment that you have a single location and that your entire company goes down the elevator, down the stairs, or out the door at the end of the day. What value is there left in that business? The days of companies having a patent or a technology or first to market or something unique uh, become less and less every year. And so, if it is true that your people then become the operating system of your company, then they directly affect your outcome. So from my experience working with mid-market companies across the United States, many companies don't seem to reach their potential or fully realize their business goals because they haven't leveraged their single biggest asset, which is their people. Now, many of you know on your balance sheet that the cost of hiring people is probably your single biggest expense or line item on anyone's budget. When companies are looking for revenue growth, margin improvement, EBITDA, they really don't look to the people category even though it's your single biggest line item in the company. And therefore, I think companies really have a tremendous opportunity to make a tremendous long-term positive impact by simply leveraging their people and through this concept known as unleashing. 
and unleashing people is sort of a, a, a new topic. It's because companies have more of an awareness today of just the relationship that culture has and how it impacts business performance. You may have seen this yourself. I believe that long-term value becomes established in your business when people are doing their best work, when they're fully engaged, when they're productive, and at their full capacity. So there's certainly a trend today that companies are much more aware of the importance of the impact of people and taking care of those people is a direct result of how they're succeeding. And so, and Steve will be outlining later some of the shifts that you're probably experiencing yourself just in how companies deal with people. There was a Gallup poll done this year which tried to measure the level of engagement of workers. So engagement becomes the holy grail or your biggest lever point for getting more from your people and realize your business goals. In this particular poll, they determined that 60% of the people were either not actively engaged or completely disengaged in using their full capabilities in their work. Secondly, there was a study, I believe last year by Global Corporate Challenge, who also wanted to look into what the cost of disengagement is in the workforce. And they discovered that on average, the average employee cost the average company three months pay in lost productivity. But what was even more substantial is they determined that that was 10 times greater than the cost of absenteeism, which traditionally people have measured as a drag or a cost on business. And this condition is simply that workers show up, your employees come to work, but they really don't work at their full potential or, or their full capability. This has a drag on your performance. So to further the engagement, there's been much more focus on culture and the relationship of culture to business performance. And you're probably aware that your culture truly has the power to either engage or disengage your people. I uh, use a definition of culture that it is a set of beliefs that govern behavior. It's the persistent beliefs and behaviors of the group that really determine what gets emphasized, what's considered important, what gets rewarded, or what gets punished. And if that's true, then the culture often determines who can work successfully in your company and who can't. Who's had somebody leave their company because they just didn't fit in or they weren't a cultural fit? Show of hands. So it happens quite often and it's really a sore point for all those involved in kind of wasted time. So this concept of engaging not, not only the people but having the right people, when engagement is high, these are the indicators. You see that employees are happy, they're focused, they're doing good work, they're productive, they're happy to be associated with your company, and these are the literal underpinnings of operational success and financial performance of a company. So Steve will, unless there's any questions or comments you want to make now. Well, I think one of the, the bigger frustrations that I'm hearing out in the community today is largely attacking the most recent generation of folks here, millennials. Um, and, and there's good reason for that, uh, but I wanted to start with sort of taking a look at what the generations are. Uh, I often really questioned what generation I fell in, but uh, I'm definitely not a baby boomer, so in case you think I'm older than that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I'm, you know, I fall in the Generation X era, uh, but what is more important is that you probably all experienced this yourself, that as of 2015, the millennial generation is, uh, has now surpassed Gen Xers in terms of the percentage. And so the frustration that perhaps you've experienced and perhaps your management team has experienced, because generally speaking, this is a broad brush, uh, managers tend to be a little bit older and then they have to manage those folks who are younger and Millennials have a much different perspective on life than Gen Xers do in terms of their experience um, and so if it's true and I think it is that we invest a, a, an incredible amount of resource in the training uh, and development of our people 
then we have to figure out a way to retain that value so that in the long term you can have uh, that person give some return on that investment. Long gone are the days uh, of my father who <coughs> worked for a company for 40 years. Uh, that has not uh, been the case for a number of years. And so the average job tenure, uh, which I, I actually felt somewhat surprised by, is that um, baby boomers on average seven years, Gen Xers five years. And I've been at Holland and Hart for 13, a previous uh, 10 in another law firm. So I guess I broke the average, but um, millennials are an incredible source of frustration because they tend to go quickly. And uh, so when I'm consulting folks on separation of millennials, it's often because they're not the cultural fit. Uh, they didn't want, you know, they wanted, uh, didn't want to take responsibility. Uh, they couldn't take the, the type of feedback that was given by managers. So I think the focus really ought to be uh, to address the challenges of the new generation is training our managers to change their perspective and to, to try to harness the, the real energy that the millennials create. Um, there's a corresponding change that's happening in our communities, if you haven't already seen with the number of cranes in our city, but it happens in, it's happening around the country. Um, a lot of city developments are what's known as live, work, play. So the concept is millennials don't really need to travel very far as long as they can live in an area very close to where they work and that they can play in that area. So if you look at some of the newer developments in the, in the community, you'll see that it, it'll have high density housing. The, the much smaller places, millennials aren't investing in homes uh, at any rate close to what the previous generation was. So they're high density housing, lots of restaurants and places to have fun, uh, you know, the health fitness component of those communities, and then technology or the opportunity to work in uh, businesses that are uh, using technology. So this live, work, play concept is a real thing, and I think it is affecting um, how millennials work in the workplace. Um, so because I think that the focus ought to be on millennials, I have worked with a number of experts out there in, in the community about what millennials want. And I think, uh, if I don't see any real widespread disagreement, you would all agree that millennials want more freedom. Uh, again, that would be consistent with the concept of live, work, play, the work around the life that they have. Uh, coach rather than boss, <coughs> feedback uh, promotions are a component of that. I think um, my experience has been that, and, and this I draw from my own personal experience in dealing with millennials <coughs> that I work with, that. It used to be you could hand someone an assignment and say, go do this, you get the work back, and you're fine with it, and you never really go back to them and say, you did great. Um, an expert that I worked with, um, not Billy Bush, but Buddy Bush, uh, has, uh, did a study, and uh, from her, I'm going to borrow it, because from her perspective, and it was a good analogy, um, millennials have grown up in and we're responsible, the Gen Xers are responsible primarily for this, but they grew up without having lots of um, failure. So this whole notion, I mean, a lot of people want to be critical of our sports programs and our youth programs where we give everyone a participation ribbon. But it's created a, a culture of folks who haven't really experienced failure. And so those that go on and go to college and get good degrees and they're educated, they've never experienced that. So they don't understand when they don't get immediate positive reinforcement and feedback that you thought they did a good job when you, you handed them the assignment and they did it and you t went on and, and, and took their work and, and moved on uh, because they want that immediate feedback. They want that, resp that responsiveness. They want that care and coddling. Uh, this is my personal experience as well. So I do think that we can change the way we work with folks and become coaches and work side by side with the folks that we work with. And that will, in fact, harness more of their uh, talents. So from a legal perspective, one of the things that I've been working with a number of clients is if we want to harness talent and we want to try to allow these folks to have opportunity, 
what can we do? Many companies, uh, primarily in the technology space in particular, but others as well, have gone to a more freelancer, independent contractor environment. Uh, and it's because they're trying to allow this new generation freedom to have broad experience, but harness pieces of the talent for their workplace. Obviously, this doesn't fit in all circumstances, and it's, there is a lot of risk. Independent contractors, in particular, create a great deal of risk in our workforce because the government hates independent contractors, absolutely despises it. For about 25 years, Congress has been trying to pass a, a federal law that effectively eliminates that classification. Now, all states have their own independent definition of what constitutes an, an independent contractor. And there's a reason for that. If you're an independent contractor, you're not an employee, right? If you're not an employee, you're not entitled to the benefits under any defined benefit plan. You wouldn't be entitled to overtime, right? And so the taxation and, and the withholding taxation changes for independent contractors. Now, in this last economic downturn, and, and really when you go back to 2001, 2002, when we had the downturn after 9-11, uh, many companies began to push towards the independent contractor model, uh, and the government pushed back with uh, lots of spot-checked audits, and we've had a number of cases where the government has said, you're misclassifying independent contractors. So I did a lot of RIFs, for instance, where we might get rid of 40, 50 people, and then the company says, hey, but I want to bring back these 10 people as independent contractors. Mm -hmm. But really, if they're solely exclusively dependent on you for financial benefit, you're directing their everyday opportunity and telling them when and where to report to work and what to do. They're much the same as an employee, therefore you can't classify them as an independent contractor. But if you are gonna do that, um, in almost every state there, there is a presumption created by law that independent contractors almost always have written agreements. So the advice is make sure you have a written agreement that, that defines what the relationship is. Um, I put in all independent contractor agreements a number of specific provisions, one on taxation and the idea that the independent contractor is responsible for it. I also put some language in there about, you know, we don't necessarily control the, the work that you do, but we can control the outcome. We don't tell the plumber who comes to our house to fix the pipe actually how to fix the pipe, but we know when the pipe is not fixed, right? So you're not going to pay them if the pipe is leaking. Similar concept. You, you, you pay by the job. Um, we don't provide tools. Now, you might provide, you have to work within this software, but you're not necessarily saying, you know, here's all the wrenches to fix the pipe. So you can provide some stuff. It is a non-exclusive relationship, and this is the benefit I think that millennials in particular like because they've experienced this opportunity to freelance. Uh, you don't want to bind them solely to work for you. And I think the government viewpoint on this, both the state and the federal government, is that if you have an exclusive relationship, that is more of an employment relationship. Now, I've had the government find for clients that up to six months of duration of exclusivity can still be an independent contractor relationship, uh, but I would not recommend it. Th those are, there are very fact-specific cases in analysis, and uh, I think the government tends to believe that anything that goes on for any length of period, three to six months, creates financial dependence. Financial dependence is a sign of an employee-employer relationship. So um, the, the final point that I would make is because a lot of companies deal with their own uh, intellectual property, you can bind independent contractors to non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements, to a lesser degree non-solicit agreements where they can't solicit the clients that you've allowed them to work for. So there is a mechanism in place that you can use uh, to have enforceable covenants uh, that restrict an independent contractor's right to steal your clients um, or even the folks that they work with in your organization. Um, another thing that uh, sort of has reemerged, um, you know, this goes back probably about 10, 15 years ago when we were doing lots of telecommuting policies, but it's reemerged 
in employee retention is this concept of telecommuting and remote work uh, spaces. Uh, and I, I thought this was interesting from 2013, which was that Cisco um, found that it saved uh, $277 million by allowing employees to telecommute. There are a lot of downsides to telecommuting, but I, I think when you have communities that are developed where commuting is a burden on employees, uh, t telecommuting is one mechanism that a company could use to uh, retain workers. And there are a bunch of other companies here, as I list, that have used that. Uh, what are the benefits of it? Generally speaking, retention of employees is much higher. Um, uh, there's enhanced morale, increased productivity. I, I think a very important one is the, uh, the issue of diversity in the workplace. Obviously, I'm a diverse person, but I do think there is a value proposition to be had by every company that creates a diverse workplace, uh, if, especially if they deal with the community at large in terms of their products. Um, the, the savings comes with the reduction in office space. Uh, many, many companies that we are working with today are moving away from the big layout that you see here <laughs> into these more open spaces. So Google is a good example of a workspace openness and sharing. Um, in Colorado alone, there are a number of these folk, these places that have cropped up where people can go in and, and rent space. It's not the old office front concept, but it's like Galvanize is one in particular that I'm aware of where you can go into an open space and work alongside people of your peer level. Um, but the benefit, the bigger benefits again are productivity, lower absenteeism, Obviously, there's a social component if you want to argue uh, reduce carbon emissions from driving. Uh, what are the legal challenges that are associated with that? Um, there are a number uh, when you have employees that work remotely because you have to have managers that have the capacity to manage via remote mechanisms. Um, I think it's getting easier for folks to understand that you can do this. Obviously, we have video tele conferencing capability like never before, so you can connect visibly with someone if you need to. Uh, but there are some legal challenges because you can't necessarily know what the person's doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So for instance, uh, if the person is working from home and they walk down the hallway and they trip over the kid's toy and they break their leg, do you have a worker's compensation liability associated with it? And I think the answer is probably yes. Um, so insurance for telecommuting uh, is important that you make sure that you, you go to the broker. We know how many telecommuters are out there. What are limits of liability are going to be? Um, there's obviously some issues of confidentiality and the trade secret theft that occur in telecommuting constructs. Um, a number of cases I've handled in the last decade where a telecommuting employee might be downloading in the normal course of their operation or daily business, a lot of very confidential information. Well, when it's once downloaded, it resides outside of your control. And so you've got to have policies in place that claw back information, perhaps. Uh, you certainly have to have that in terms of trying to protect the trade secret. Uh, so I do think, um, uh, and finally, a negative impact of career advancement being one. But I, I do think telecommuting is, is very good. Um, what are some of the policies that I'm seeing changed as a result of employee retention? Um, you know, a good example of a policy change was when the internet first came out, there were all those studies that talked about lost productivity because your employees were doing personal business over the internet. You know, many companies have gotten away from a strict prohibition against saying you can't do any of that because there's a recognition that if we don't allow people to do some things like you know, cash deposit checks, check their bank account, call their school, um, then you don't get as much productivity out of them because they have to do it at some point. So we, we, we have moved away from those strict policy developments, but kind of gone towards uh, making sure you, you should have a social media policy. Um, the NLRB uh, has specific policies that you can find that it has found even in a non-union union setting are permissible in terms of managing social media, but a big, it's a big issue, obviously, can, continues to be both posting in Facebook negative comments about an employer, uh, 
Twitter, uh, you know, d d damaging or defaming one's competitors. A lot of liability can cr be created by our employees. So making sure we have those kinds of policies, um, bringing your own devices and managing the, the mobile device is also critically important because um, we still have, as everyone knows, exemptions for people who aren't entitled to overtime and those who are entitled to overtime. And if you allow people to work from home and, and do work for you via remote means, sometimes that creates liability in the wage and hour context. So you have to be managing that as well. Um, and then finally, a number of other little policies, recording and photos, listening to music, off the clock work. So uh, important policies to make sure that if you're gonna sort of move into the next generation, we're mindful of those things. Um, with respect to managing the millennials, I mentioned earlier this con concept of providing meaningful feedback. Um, I think most talking heads, including me, who, who, who discuss this issue, it's this notion of repetitive and frequent feedback, even where the feedback is going to be positive uh, and helping that person along. That's the coach rather than the boss ideal. Uh, for purposes of maintaining folks. Um, now, Chet mentioned culture. Uh, culture, the lifeblood of an institution. It's sort of the heartbeat or the soul. Um, but there it has been a push, a, a little bit, I think, towards the idea that culture can be created by the atmosphere, the physical space. Uh, there probably are a number of you who disagree with that. But you can see this is just a picture of the, uh, the Google workspace versus an old school um, workspace cubicle construct, um, which would you rather be in, I think is important. Um, but what are those factors that you want to consider? Uh, some of these, perhaps, we can argue about in terms of whether they truly are the creators of culture, because I think, obviously, the soul is created by the folks that work with you. But they help, physical workspace, uh, the, the, the feeling of openness, um, a collaboration area, uh, areas is particularly important to millennials. You know, what we require people to wear. Um, you know, I still have colleagues who cannot stand the fact that we dress down on Fridays. Sometimes I'll come in on jeans on a Wednesday. And, you know, my senior partners that I work with, they're 65, they hate it. But the 30 the something year olds, they do it out of a normal course. They, they don't even ask questions, even though we have policies that deal with it. But you kind of have to deal with that. Um, and I think pushing the team versus the individual is a critical uh, component of creating a, a positive culture. And finally, technology. Obviously, technology has created an ease with which we can do our work at a higher productivity level. So very important to, uh, to be technologically advanced in terms of what your offerings are. It can help, obviously, in the telecommuting con concept, making sure they have the most available technology so that they can work pro proactively with their management team. Um, and then, uh, uh, Chet, I'll let you move on with attraction. Any questions about Steve's topic, comments? <coughs> Thanks, Steve. Yeah, there's really uh, many aspects that make up the value chain of the people in your company, but three of the biggest ones are your ability to attract, develop, and retain people. And they are intricately linked because you can't really say where one stops and another finishes. They're all one sort of link in a chain or a continuum. But the number one rule that I would encourage anyone, particularly in today's world, is to attract people who share your values and can flourish in your culture. That becomes a real sticking point for many companies. They realize six months or a year and a half in that they have people that just really aren't a very good fit. When you have this powerful combination of good people who are passionate about the work that they're doing with their company, their productivity goes up and profits are realized. A powerful combination. Companies like Google didn't get there uh, by accident. They planned out uh, how they're going to interact with their people. So in terms of attracting, here's a couple of things that you'd probably benefit from. 
And the first one is when you're in the attraction mode and you're recruiting people and you're evaluating them for your company, put together very accurate, detailed position descriptions. You'd be amazed at how many companies wrote a position description 10 or 20 years ago and never really modified them at all. In fact, the job today doesn't even look like the one that was originally created. But more importantly, they should include the performance expectations for the role. What the results that are expected? What outcome do you want from this job? Because if you're ever going to be able to have some level of accountability, the, the job description has to be detailed enough that you can actually hold people accountable. Secondly, do what you can to invest in sharpening your interview and evalu in evaluation skills, not just if you're hiring people, but these skills, if you're in a leadership position or if you manage a small team of people, they're going to be important to you going forward in your entire career. The emphasis, as Steve pointed, that people are looking more for coaches than they are for bosses, you're going to be expected to be able to develop teams and people and provide insight and work in team environments. That requires uh, all of us to have more ability to do evaluations of how to deal with people. And then finally, I recommend that you use assessments whenever possible. Assessments have come a long, long way in, in 25 years. They're uh, scaringly accurate. They've been uh, validated for every employment situation, but they have the ability to help reinforce for you uh, someone's sales ability, their leadership skills. They measure emotional intelligence, which is directly related to people's uh, productivity in the workplace. So use them as an additional tool to provide some insight into who you're working with, whether you're talking about um, for selecting someone or not. Most people aren't great interviewers, just simply that you don't do it time and time again to get really, really proficient at it. But everyone senses something when they're interviewing. They may not be able to put their finger on it or they may not be able to know what the word is, but they do sense it. And I found that these assessments can sometimes provide you the language or the description of what you're sensing. There, there is a legal perspective to this particular slide. Um, position descriptions in particular uh, are important to be modified on a regular basis. And that is because this newer workforce, they look at the position description and that mm. defines the box of their role and responsibility. When they're asked to go outside that box, you get, you get some reluctance, but certainly a feeling of, I can't be held accountable for what's outside that box. So I do think position descriptions are important. They're also important when we're dealing with the unproductive employee who we're trying to show the door to because they also frame the basis upon which you begin to discipline them for poor performance. Finally, in the case of a disabled person who uh, is working for us, who is you know, injured, disabled, has a temporary condition that we need to accommodate under the Americans with Disabilities Act, the position description becomes the source of the essential functions. Uh, interview and evaluative skills, um, there, you know, there's this gut instinct that happens uh, I often get questions about social media research on the front end, the hiring side. Encourage everyone to Google a, the candidate that you're interviewing because there's a lot of resource out there to do it. Uh, I think we've long got past, for the most part, relying on credit checks, that sort of thing, with the exception of you know, maybe highly sensitive financial positions within a company. But most people do not do credit checks or background checks today because the EEOC has found that those things can be the basis of discrimination because on the credit check front, there's a socioeconomic reason that a lot of people don't have good credit, but I'll be honest with you, it's a widespread problem with millennials anyway. Um, on the background check, on a criminal basis, many minority groups tend to have a higher frequency of crime, misdemeanor level basis, petty crime stuff, if you begin to screen on that, you're going to have a disparate impact that screens out too many minorities and can be illegal. Um, and Chet's right, using assessments 
are very, very important. It's this idea of, of repetitive feedback uh, to millennials, which is important, but it also allows managers the opportunity to move on to those people who are problematic for the culture, who aren't performing. You gotta have a, a, a basis to terminate um, now, we're an at-will state, but we're primarily known for the exceptions to the at-will doctrine than we are for the at-will doctrine. So managing a person out the door the right way, using assessments, whether it's a formal review. I know a lot of companies are moving away from formal performance reviews. Some sort of review on a regular basis about the performance of the employee. Yeah, good point. And regarding assessments, uh, never make a hiring decision based on an assessment and preferably don't ever use just one. Assessments really ought to be sort of like how you do references, meaning that you've spent considerable time with people and you reach out to references that have been provided to you and they ought to confirm what you've already discovered. It's a bad thing when a reference says something that's completely different from how you've experienced this person. And think of assessments as another reference point for you and they should just really confirm your perception of these people. So there's clearly increased reliance on assessments nationally, uh, not only for just the selection process, but for all development work and for team building. Uh, they're used extensively. And even the Wall Street Journal reported recently that nearly 60% of the Fortune 500 are now using assessments in some way and so it's really considered today to be a best practice for HR professionals and companies that are really devoted to developing their people. So I really encourage you that it really will help you be better informed, it will help you make better decisions, and I think you'll get better outcomes by incorporating them. The second component I mentioned uh, besides attraction was development. And you're seeing an increasing uh, impact being made by companies focusing on developing their people. Last year, Gallup did a poll that explored the reasons that employees uh, made job changes, etc. And what they found out is that the overwhelming majority, 90%, now these are just the people that they polled, when they changed jobs or changed roles, they changed companies. That means for their next position, less than 10% of the people that were part of this particular poll, when they took a new job, stayed with their own company. So why do you think that might happen? Yeah, they may not see them. They might even be there, but maybe they're not communicated. And so this whole idea of development or the perception thereof getting back to this coach versus boss model is particularly important. I believe that when you make an investment in professional development, you get to participate in the success of your people. Now everyone wins by doing this. The person gets developed, they're on your team, the company benefits, everyone wins. So consider in your companies, what process do you have to identify, develop, reward, acknowledge your very best people. Not only to higher levels of performance, but higher capability. Because when you do this, you get more valuable people in your company. And you know that is a, a resident asset that no one can duplicate. Companies can uh, compete with you, they can uh, you know, compete with you by copying products. They can um, have a, a cheaper value equation. They might have a different business model, but no one can compete with your collection of people. And lastly, on the note of development, consider adding coaching as part of your development plans for your people. In the past, it's often been just executives that were coached, but the trend today is clearly uh, people in any management position are benefiting from coaching and incorporating that into your toolbox of available resources. Even CNN reported earlier this year that business coaching is really on the rise, but not so much that it's on the rise, but they're anticipating it to be a staple, a trend that's going to 
continue well into the future. And then the last point about the value chain of attraction, development, and retention. Last year, LinkedIn did a survey, and you know that there's millions of people that are on LinkedIn, and they discovered, those that participated in this survey, that the number one reason that people left their jobs was their perception of lack of career development. So consider that when you're mapping out what you do for people. And at least half of those people said that there was a perception, they were led to believe it was their feeling that the new company offered them stronger career path, more opportunities, more development options. Do you think the solution might be uh, earlier and often promotions, despite what the value of that promotion is on a financial basis, could be marginal uh, steps of increase, but uh, I, I don't know what that would look like, so I'm curious your comments on that. Well, people love uh, interaction. People like to get noticed. People want to see their good work acknowledged. And particularly in light of you saw the tenure of people just going down, that they no longer are going to wait for a dozen years to get a promotion. And so even if they're tiny promotions and tiny pay raises, people notice at the end of the day. And lastly, unless you've been living under a rock for the last decade, you probably know that what people want from their job and now expect from their employer has really changed. And the environment that Steve described earlier is people are really coming into the workforce now and they're expecting that they're going to be in an environment where they're learning, where they're growing, where they're building capability, that they have opportunities, they can advance their career. And to the extent to which your company is viewed as not providing that, then you're probably not going to be viewed as the employer of choice. So just consider that. Ask yourself if you believe in the 80-20 rule or humans fall very cleverly into bell curves. So we know that there's some percentage, call it 20%, that your absolute best people. These people would hurt if, it, if they left. So ask yourself, your very best people, how are, how are you going about going forward to identify, develop, reward, promote them? And do you have a way that you can stay in touch with them other than once a year to ensure and measure somehow that they're not only engaged, but they're satisfied? So very important in terms of retention. Yeah, retention is an interesting uh, issue um, and one that I think everyone is challenged with as an employer. Uh, some ideas on programs that you can create uh, along the lines of, of recognition that if we understand that our workforce will turn over quickly, uh, what are ways we might delay that departure by a year or 18 months or two years? Uh, and so I, I've seen a number of clients develop programs, uh, you use coaching as a construct, but other types of programs like business development programs where you're teaching some, someone in a sales force sales skills and you're open about the idea that you understand that these are long-term skills that you're teaching them and it's, a, it's something they get to take with them and that's why they stay because they want to exhaust the, the educational program on business development. So it's a program, it's an investment into a program knowing that you're gonna lose the person anyway, but you're gonna to try to keep them for a period of time so that you maximize your investment to the degree you can. So that's one idea that I've seen out there. Obviously, uh, straightforward business coaching on co you know, coaching a person generally. Uh, brand coaching, you know, helping folks uh, utilize LinkedIn appropriately and understanding how to brand themselves uh, is a future skill that one could take with them. So you can bring in uh, any type of educational program that you set up on sort of a campus university construct that says, you know, we have at Holland and Hart, the Holland and Hart University, where we put on a monthly program that is open to anyone who wants to participate and it's you know free lunch provided but those are those are very uh, important types of programs that help build a strong workforce so you want to create um, 
you, your sweet spot is obviously going to be somewhere in between the pay and benefits. We don't work for free, but I, I will submit to you that pay doesn't necessarily drive the current workforce, right? So it's this work-life balance and what that reward is going to be and this recognition by all of us that most people's forward-looking prospect from the millennial perspective is very short-term. It's going to be you know, three to five years. They're not looking what I'm going to be in 20 years. So recognizing that, we want to tailor our benefits and rewards to optimize our investment. Uh, some things, I mentioned telecommuting, which I won't go into, uh, but other things that many businesses are using to great success, flexible days and hours, uh, the flex work day, important because it, like telecommuting, can save on space because you, you can have office sharing arrangements um, where someone works this particular number of hours and then you use the same workspace that's shared by a different person, but they use that workspace as well. So uh, you're maximizing a folks' willingness to work. Flexible work days work particularly well with women. Uh, obviously a diverse issue for many workplaces, um, uh, but recognizing some of the, the issues that women face. Job sharing, another great area where you can maybe split the FTE between two different people. So I've had a number of clients that go, go that route depending on the type of position. Um, and then reduced or flex timing um, in, a, in an organization. You know, from a policy perspective, all of these have to have certain policies developed around them so that you set forth clear expectation. Uh, again, my, my, my ideal for all employers is to make sure you put a boundary between behavior because the best way to manage behavior is keep someone within the boundary. Once you allow someone to step outside the boundary, the boundary then becomes where they stepped outside, and that's where you lose control of a problem employee. But when you do these flexible work circumstances, you've got to make sure you control both what you expect and what you want in return and communicate those, those things clearly. And, and reduce time is probably one of that's very important because it often impacts one's growth within a company. If you're working 75% of the time, um, you don't necessarily get the same advancement opportunity as someone who's working 100% of the time. So again, if you have seniority type systems in your policies, you're gonna have to adjust them for the, this type of flexible, um, flexible communication or uh, working environment, I'm sorry. Uh, using technology, um, again, this is part of the, the, the university kind of construct that I mentioned earlier, where you can do and allow online resources. Develop, you can develop training programs uh, that are perceived as a, a training opportunity for our work workforce. Um, and this enhances one's opportunity to participate and, of course, recognizes the mobility that uh, folks work. Um, you know, laptops probably a bad example since almost all of us probably have one today. But uh, making sure that depending on the type of business you're in, that you, they have the kind of technology that's going to enhance mobility as opposed to restrict. Again, making sure you have policies that govern it are going to be important. Um, time off benefits. Um, we've seen a number of companies revisit things of the past. Um, Unlimited vacation, the number of clients that have come back in the last couple of years eliminating their PTO vacation sick leave policies in favor of an open take whatever time you need to take. Uh, that's particularly good for a millennial who is focused on the work-life balance. It has obvious pitfalls because <laughs> you need to make sure that, yeah, where, what are you doing today? Um, but we have... We have revised a number of those types of policies in the effort to enhance the benefits that one might perceive. Um, sabbatical programs, um, coming back, I think a little bit in vogue, there is a substantial cost to a sabbatical program, um, but one that might in the right business model, and I'll, you know, I've been using Holland & Hart for some reason today as an example, but we continue to have a sabbatical program. And while it is expensive, it is one of those things that creates part of our legacy culture and attracts people to be 
lawyers here because they know that that's uh, an offering that we give. Now, only recently have we expanded it beyond the partner ranks. And so we've just unveiled a program to allow our staff attorneys to take advantage, depending on their years of service within, a, within the firm, uh, of a mini sabbatical program that they can take advantage of. So that's something that we've done as, in our effort to try to make sure we retain our talent. Um, you know, I do think that th this one, again, probably uh, just a derivative of the expanded vacation, but uh, personal leaves for unrestricted reasons, um, you know, missionary trips, hikes. This is something that a lot of, uh, of the newer generation folks tend to want to do. So, you know, they want to go to China for six weeks. Um, rather than have them quit, you could allow them to do that. You could do it in a one-off circumstance. I mean, in other words, you can negotiate individually every time this opportunity con is confronted. It's a little bit difficult to do it that way um, without creating a one-size-fits-all policy because what happens when we do something for you and then I refuse to do it for you, that's where we create differential treatment, at least the perception of differential treatment. Uh, it is a fertile ground for claims of discrimination because the key to discrimination is I was treated differently than the majority person was treated, therefore it must be because you don't like me because of my race. So if we're gonna do something like this, I would suggest you don't do it on a one-off basis, that you just have a leave of absence policy that allows a leave of absence for a specific period of time for no reason that you have to approve. Um, it might well benefit you because you retain someone who you know wants to do something like uh, Walk the Appalachian Trail. Um, yes. Um, on the, I was just thinking on the unlimited vacation. So with regard to when they leave, basically they have zero vacation time. Yes. Yeah, so the key. Uh, that's a great question. Um, under Colorado law, generally speaking, I'm going to say generally speaking because I don't think our Department of Labor really knows uh, what they want to do. Um, just as an aside, I have to. I have to kind of comment on this. So the Department of Labor for years would not take an official position as to whether you could have a use it or lose it policy in Colorado. And there were a lot of lawyers who believed that if you, by contract, have a forfeiture provision, that that is a contractual provision that's unenforceable because it violates public policy. So you've heard the concept, you can't enter into an illegal contract, right? I can't enter into a contract with you to go kill someone because the courts won't enforce that contract. And so I couldn't sue you for not doing what you said you would do. Same construct in, this, in the wage context. I can't enter into a forfeiture provision because the, the wage law in Colorado says at the time of my separation, you owe me all the wages that I've, been, that I've earned. And in most plans, there's some sort of accrual process in vacation. So the Department of Labor for years would never take a position as to whether that was true. Uh, most of us as in the community just developed these, pro these use it or lose it programs. So you had a certain accrual, you reached the accrual, no more accrual. You left, you got what you accrued, um, but beyond that, you know, there was a cap uh, or there were some other ones where it was just a, a, a straightforward richer. Um, so the, the, the Department of Labor, um, with a changeover in command recently when uh, Bill Ritter left, they announced a position that forfeiture provisions were in fact illegal. Uh, that lasted about six weeks because <laughs> what they forgot is that the, the state of Colorado had in fact, the, for all state employees, developed a forfeiture provision for state employees. So uh, they are back to what they were before, although uh, you can't have a use it or lose it program. So to your question, unlimited vacation, you've got to put clear, sp specific things in the policy, like there's no accrual, it's not a vested determinant be benefit. There's some key language that we would use because the Wage Act uses those types of languages or language. So as long as it's clear that it's not a vested benefit, it's not going to be paid out at termination, th those are the key components of that type of a policy. So with respect to feedback, um, you know, I do think, and I think we've said this more than once today, regular feedback, uh, giving folks more responsibility uh, tied to some form of an award program, if you will, uh, because it may, may not be the incentives in terms of 
moving someone from a cate different category job in a promotion, but uh, developing a, an award program or incentive and bonus program that recognizes and rewards good behavior. Uh, it's almost a Pavlov's dog kind of con concept. Uh, and then promotions is going to, I think, appease the most recent generation that we're, we're going to only increasingly have to deal with here. Um, and then I, I've mentioned other benefits here, a couple of few other ones that I've seen recently, uh, student loan repayment programs. Um, you know, th these are obviously ones you have to have policies around, but they're designed to create that long-term connection to an employee. So I'll pay your student loan off at this rate, I would never say you do lump sum payments, right? You might pay the payment on their student loan while they're there and then have some contractual obligation that if they leave within any given period of time, they have to pay you back. Uh, whether you collect that is a different matter, but making sure, that's why I would never recommend a lump sum payment. Uh, pay time off for charitable work. You know, th These are all things that I think help your, your image. You can use it as a brand component anyway, externally but also um, you know, gives our, the folks that work for you an opportunity to do things. Um, small things, the small gestures like the free lunch Friday uh, ideal, uh, allowing your pet to come to the workplace. Some of those have some pitfalls. The, the lunch one, really no pitfall other than cost. The pet pitfall because of allergies um, and you know, yeah. So you got to deal with that, but I think we deal with that the same way we deal with people that don't have good hygiene, right? So you can you, you got to have deep, decent policies to to work with. So uh, you know, wrapping up, um, I do think there is a significant and changing workplace, uh, one that all of us here have to manage. Not only the ones the people that work with us directly, but if you're servicing clients or consulting with clients that are facing these challenges. Um, you know, investing in your capital, engaging, and then creating that productive and uh, productive workplace is going to allow us all to be successful. And with that phone call, I'll uh, depart. No, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, but on that note, uh, I think we are finished with our comments and want to uh, give you an opportunity to ask any sort of questions you would like. And if you have none, then you get to leave early. Yes, ma'am. Can we get a copy of this presentation? If you'd like a copy, yes. Uh, we'll be sending it out via email. Great, thank you. So um, the philosophy is nice, but I'm still struggling. Um, we have a small not-for-profit, generally excellent <coughs> level workforce, okay? And um, with... Um, increases in money just being this big when you start differentiating the good from the excellent or the excellent from the very good um, and then try to want to give incremental sort of um, recognition uh, the, the the increments get so small I'm just trying to figure out if they become meaningless or if just the notion of the recognition or that and I'm going to combine another one that sort of title or increase in responsibility is a recognition for doing a good job, do the titles then become, you know, less meaningful? The increase, the title, whatever, because, assuming the, um, the, the background that I just told you about the organization. You know, if you've got an organization where you actually have the bell curve you're talking about, but ours is high bell curve to high, you know, it's a, you have a little, little place to go. I, I have my thoughts, Chet, do you wanna go ahead and start? Um, well, go ahead if you had something. Um, well, I, you know, I understand that particular issue because you've you heard me ask the question in maybe a slightly different way earlier, which is those, those percentage increases become meaningless for most people. And so I do think it is a generational interpretive issue that if you have an aged workforce, there's no use to, no utility in creating a structure where you have those those types of you know, meaningless, as you put it, raises or promotions. I think that as a philosophical perspective, it is a how do you want to design your organization and where is that type of 
methodology going to be most successful? And so I would suggest to you that if a component of your business is going to have a high number of millennials, and I don't want to unnecessarily pick on them, but if, if you're going to have a high number of millennials or you're going to have high turnover, that's the best place to put that type of system. In. Exactly. So it's an organizational design yeah. issue, not necessarily, it doesn't work. I think it works in a component of your organization if you can design it that way, but on the whole, maybe your organization wouldn't use that util that tool because of the age of the workplace and the type of generation. We're mostly X. Right. You know, a huge amount of X, and um, we don't really bring in, you know, we bring at the high top of the millennial. You know, we don't bring a new learners in. So. Right, know. and that's why that the slide about the generational de definition is unique. I mean, it's interesting to me because it goes way back, right? And um, I, I do think there is that there's some stretch to how you would define it in reality because some people, while they may be an X, Maybe they act like a millennial, yeah. right? Oh, and I think that's true for all of them, that we all, you know, <coughs> just looking at some of the new things. And I think, you know, the baby boomers used to be exes, potentially, you know, I mean, depending on... Yeah, and I, I think based on your, your comment, your organization probably is going to eventually turn that X over into what becomes a millennial. And what might be more a solution to retention and productivity increase in your organization is sort of looking at the, how, how do we create a benefit that is more valuable to those people who put a higher value on, the, you know, I don't want a 10 cent raise, I want something meaningful, I, you know, a $10,000 raise means something to me. So setting up your organization so that you recognize that you have that type of workforce. Yeah, sorry to so. just apply. Thank you. Yes, sir. I had a question on the, the tenure. Um, when you showed the statistics with it, where the millennials kind of fall in the two years in a row, then you know, kind of jumps up with uh, Gen X. Any research or anything that you've seen based upon when Gen Xers were in the age that the millennials are in right now, that were they kind of shifting as well? I seem to recall way back when that it was like a three to four years, where maybe it wasn't the two years, but is there some similarity that you're able to pull from what we're experiencing with millennials right now? with what Gen Xers were doing 10, 15 years ago? I suppose the, the answer is yes, I have seen that studies. I'm not, I'm not recalling that it was three to four years. Um, I do think it is a cultural shift in the country, right? Mm -hmm. So I use my dad as an example. It was a four year dedicated, I'm only gonna work for this company because I love this company and I want the gold watch, right? Mm -hmm. That generation died with, with them. Um, and then I think, you know, got them working for you. Right. Yeah, well, you could, depending on your business, you could have some of those folks, but they're the ones that are the most dedicated and they'll go to the grave working for you. I do think that Xers lost a little bit of that loyalty. And I've always believed, by the way, that the reason we lost that loyalty is that the employment laws in this country started to penalize employers for doing, for sort of doing the good deed for employees and, and it reduced our accountability, but it also reduced our feeling that our employer was gonna be loyal to us. So I think Xers were affected. That's just my personal view. I've not seen a study that proves it other than my own personal experience with, with you know, interviewing and investigating wrongdoing in the workplace and people saying, hey, they were never gonna do anything for me. Um, so why, why do I care is the, is the concept. But um, so yeah, there was, it, it's been a gradual decline in terms of Loyalty. I also believe that the other, the other is another component to it, which is companies used to not tread on other people's territory, and now it's everyone eats each other. And so, if I'm Google and I want programmers from Yahoo, I just go over there and I try to take as many as I possibly can, and I rate them because they've already invested the money and training. The talent. Why now? I don't have to train them. I already they're already talented. Bring them over here, and then you take them in mass. So I think competition has been uh, definitely increased. Margins have been reduced as well. So, all right. Uh, hearing no other questions. Thank you so much for for coming. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And if you have any questions, you'll know how to reach either Chad or myself. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Nice to meet you.